Hello and welcome back to another video. Today I'm talking about the, the Prime Film XA Super Edition dedicated 35mm film scanner. I probably shouldn't be waving it around like this, but I've been using this for a couple of weeks and this really is a, um, a real step up for dedicated 35mm scanning options. It doesn't do medium format, it doesn't do anything but 35mm, but what it does do is it does 35mm well well enough to get the detail, the kind of clarity, and the um, the kind of, it does the format justice in a way that things like Epson flatbeds really struggle with. And one of the main advantages, sounds strange, is that they still make these, they're readily available, and they work on modern machines. If I just give you a quick walkthrough of um, what's out there, sort of scanning wise. So we'll have, maybe down here, we're gonna have things like, um, you know those those Amazon sort of tower scanning things with the CCD sensors? And then maybe on the other extreme, we have things like drum scanners. The This scale, by the way, is how good uh, a kind of a 35 millimeter scan you can get. It goes up from here quite sporadically. You have things like the Plustec optic film I've actually reviewed previously. Then you have things like the um, the Minolta Dimage or the, the the Nikon Cool Scans, those were like the gold standard in the early sort of thousands and 2010s. And um, as you go up, you get much more difficult workflows. For example, next after those are things like the Noritsu Mini Lab Scanners. At this point, you actually need a dedicated machine to run those on. It's hilarious if you watch eBay listings, which. Uh, I'm honest, I don't do that often, but I have seen occasionally. You'll see this scanner from 2008 sold with a whole computer and monitor and power supply just because of how outdated the kit is. Above that, you have things like the Emicons and Hasselblad Flex Tights. I mean, you're going to get a big bill if you buy one of those these days. Hasselblad don't make them anymore. I doubt they even service them. And then at the end, you have things like the, the drum scanners. Um, they are like £50,000 for the, the proper big installations. So obviously that's unachievable and that's one of the things that people take to labs. But taking film to your labs isn't that sustainable because they charge so much. And uh, buying something like this, for about £450 or $480, so whatever the exchange rate might be today, is one of those things that allows you to shoot 35mm and produce your own sort of print-worthy and definitely online worthy images. So I'm gonna go through it. I'm gonna show you some example prints. I'm gonna show off some of the features. Um, in fact, we can talk about one right now. This is one of the only scanners on the market for under a thousand pounds that will comfortably eat through a entire sort of 36, 38 picture roll of 35 mil. If you think about things like the, the Nikon cool scans, you actually have to buy quite an expensive adapter or modify them to get them to take whole rolls of film. But this can do it out of the box. The truth is I actually don't really do that too often, but having the ability to have a scanner which you set up and then just forget about and you just let it eat through the roll is obviously very convenient. The um, the worst thing about things like the Plustex or even the Epsons is having to change the, the magazine so that you can scan more of your roll. But having something that just goes through it is amazing. It has, limited controls on it and uh, you can sort of jog it forward and backwards to, to line up your frames. And I will say that I've heard over the course of 36 rolls, it can clip a couple of them. Um, but to have a batch feeding scanner is just so convenient. You um, you don't have to worry about every, every frame, or every six frames sort of going over and adjusting things. The software that comes with it is a bit quirky. I actually use mine with Silverfast. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you one of the best features of it, which is the, the autofocus. Having autofocus on a scanner is such a big deal. And anyone that's shot with a flatbed or scanned with a flatbed will know that having those awful frames, actually, I don't have any to hand, they're not with me at the moment. But those, those little feet, they're awful. This has real autofocus. So let's let's cut to um, to me looking in uh, Silverfast and I'll show you what that's about. I'm gonna show you it in Silverfast, but this isn't the Silverfast feature. This is simply 
uh, the software that I use with the scanner. So if you use ViewScan or even the kind of proprietary software that comes with the scanner, you'll still be able to do this. But let's just have a look at the kind of difference this can make. Now, I normally use autofocus, but for this video, I'm just gonna show you manual focus because it does this nice sort of before and after preview. But let's have a quick look. So it's set to 1.2 millimeters. There's a high chance that is correct. And you can see that looks pretty sharp. We're seeing quite a lot of grain. This is 400p black and white, so obviously quite a grainy film stock. But let's just have a quick look at what happens if, for example, I move this to 0.1. Obviously the YouTube compression might be doing its own adjustments, but I'm going to tell you if I can perceive an increase in sharpness. So actually 0 0.1 looks not that much softer, but definitely softer. And let's go up here to three millimeters, which is this, the maximum adjustment I can make. So it's very unlikely that this will be very sharp. But you can see how noticeably soft that is. I'm, I'm sure even YouTube has a big differential between those two images. And now from our 1.2 before, let's go auto. And this is actually gonna let the scanner choose what it thinks is the sharpest. So I, to be honest, I wouldn't be surprised if it did pick 1.2, but likewise 1.3, 1.4, uh, 1.1, it, it's gonna be somewhere in that ballpark. So interestingly, it's chosen two, which is noticeably softer. Let's go auto again. I think I've given it an unfair test by showing it three and then uh, saying, all right, off you go, because obviously three would have been pretty dramatic. But yeah, having run it twice, it's on 1.1. And just gonna wait a second for the preview to update. And 1.1 and 1.2 both look incredibly sharp. I am, um, yeah, I'd be hard pressed to tell between those. So one of the quirks of the scanner and something that you should definitely be aware of is that it makes very strange sounds. It often sounds like it's broken or at least is trying to break itself. I've just got a little demo clip here of me using the autofocus and not a healthy sound, but mine's been doing it since new and it's working fine. So take it with a pinch of salt. I'm just gonna do a quick speed comparison test. Uh, don't worry, I won't make you do the whole thing. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna scan one negative uh, black and white 16 bits without ISRD. And then immediately we're gonna scan a color negative 48 bit, uh, which is silver fast marketing blabber for 16 bit RGB. And I'll put a timer in the frame. We can see quite how long um, the scanner takes per frame. So the scanner itself is really easy to operate. You have a an input port for the film here, and uh, this isn't plugged in at the moment. Obviously, I'm demonstrating it to you, but it takes up the film, and uh, there's a little logo here that shows you to put the numbers in, not reversed. In other words, um, emulsion side down into there. That's just for optimal autofocus and detail. There are four buttons on the top and uh, they're pretty self-explanatory. You get eject, reverse, forward, and scan. The scan button doesn't work if you're not using the uh, special software that comes with it, Cyberview. So if you're using sort of normal software, because the Cyberview is pretty weird, the, the scan button does nothing. You get a reverse and forward button, and that in conjunction with the little window on the top of the scanner allows you to see how your frame has been aligned and then adjust your framing. It doesn't scan the whole film rebate, so you're really just able to adjust sort of forward and backwards. So you're adjusting the sides of your frame if you shot horizontally, but that is useful. 
if you're doing the back scanning thing, you have to trust it, but you can jog your uh, kind of maybe 0.1 of a millimeter per press, very small movement. So sometimes you give it a couple of taps and make sure that you're nicely lined up. The last button is eject. And um, if you tap that, it actually doesn't work. But if you give it a good long press, it will just eject the film strip. That's useful if you will forget to eject your film and close silver fast. You can just press that to get your film out and uh, be on your way. So it's all well and good talking about functionality and uh, ease of use, but if the image quality is not there, then it's not a good scanner. So let's jump into Photoshop. And what I'm actually gonna do is I'll do a screen recording straight out of the computer so you can see what the files look like as I open them. Uh, let's jump in now and I'll show you the, uh, the couple of files that I've got as, uh, as a kind of reference for how the, the 35 mil output from this scanner can look. Okay, so here's the one of uh, Katie. You saw me use this for the autofocus test, but let's have a look. You can see that I actually, this is the second take of this segment and I did do a few adjustments. So the ISOD obviously only works for the image when it's not black and white. But if I skip through this, you should see the, uh, there's a couple of, um, there's one on the shoulder, for example. What I do is when I get to this stage of the process, because I scan at 5,000 DPI, I will actually have an enormously bloated file. So if you look here, it says it's uh, 7,000 pixels along the long side. That's way too much. And there's not a true amount of detail. There's not, that, I mean, that, that's, uh, that's way too big. So what I do is I resample that to about 3,000 pixels along the long side. So this smaller image is very similar in details, but you'll notice if I actually go back into image size that it's 11 meg now, which is much more appropriate. Um, did a few spot healing brushes, just because you can see there's one there on her shoulder. And if I click through, um, just repeating the edits, if you know Photoshop, this is basically the um, adjustment that I did. Then I reverted back to that just to show you guys. But if I go back to um, view levels layer, really slight adjustments. So it's just a little bit of um, sort of setting the white and black point. It, it, it's the taste. I mean, I don't have to tell you guys how to edit film scans. But what I will say is that this software gets you a lot closer to the finished presentable image than things like Epson scan or even DSLR scanning can get you this quickly. I'd say this image is pretty ready to go. Um, if I was gonna post this, what I'd probably do is chuck a four by three crop on it. And, uh, and I'd say that's pretty ready to go in terms of scan to scan to finish. It's, it's not bad. Um, yeah, that's one picture. I've got another picture, which is color image. And this is an image that I've actually used previously when comparing scanners. So I dug this one out and rescanned it. So if we do the same thing in here, let's have a look. Uh, okay, so I've already resampled this to 3000, but let's go in now just to 100% and, and have a quick look at detail, I guess, color accuracy, um, zoom in on the grill. I think the focus is probably on the, the number plate. And in this image, in fact, my, my first my first assessment is that there's a fair amount of, uh, of color noise. I don't know if that's in the grain or if that's a, um, that could be a digital thing from the scanner. That could be because I was using Agfa Vista, which is a consumer film. But the amount of detail I think is really quite impressive. The one thing that scares me a bit in here is the ISRD uh, artifacting. If you've seen it before, it's when the infrared dust detection channel does weird things. But this is a pretty clean negative, and I'm actually looking for it now and can't really find much. I uh, wonder what this, this stuff here, that could be a little bit of ISRD. But um, if you're willing to dig up my previous video on the Epson, you might find that, uh, yeah, this definitely outperforms the Epson and I wouldn't be too surprised if it outperforms the, uh, the plus tech as well. 
but yeah there we go two shots and lastly we got the the birds image now this image is another one heaps of detail uh obviously the aperture here is probably something like f2 because the back of the cage isn't in focus but you can see i mean maybe i give this guy a little bit of uh high pass sharpening and if i just bring that down to about 30 percent you can see it's actually not doing a huge amount the uh the file itself has uh yeah impressive impressive amount of detailing um, they are 16-bit tips, so pretty good as uh, in terms of editing. If I was to say, let's see if I can take the yellows and move these birds to a slightly different color. Uh, let's make them more orange. See what that looks like. Or I might want to do something like this, and then maybe I want to go into the one of the channels, and let's just put a few control points in here. And let's add a bit of blue into the shadows. Uh, you can see underneath it's uh, maybe that's a bit too much. Let's do it like this. But if you want to pull the colors around, um, you can. And uh, and the 16-bit TIFF file will let you do a lot more than a 8-bit um, JPEG or fucking. Uh, at least you've got 16 bits rather than DSLR scanning. But yeah, how do they look to you? I um, I don't know how you're viewing them. You might be using an iPhone or maybe you're watching it on an 8K monitor. I um, I think they look pretty good and I'm viewing them in Photoshop on my laptop. So I'm probably not even looking at them in full res. I think if they were printed, they'd be definitely enough for A4 or thereabouts. So it really doesn't matter how much detail you can get if you get infinite detail you can't really use it so i have decided that around 3000 pixels along the long side is enough for whatever i want to do with these pictures and this scanner gets that for me so i think it's time for a conclusion well thanks for watching i guess that we can wrap things up now it's not a proper scanning video without at least five minutes spent faffing around in photoshop but you can see the the scans look pretty good the scanner isn't particularly fast isn't particularly slow what it is is particularly convenient it just gets you the picture you want and um doesn't doesn't give you too much strain in reaching that point stay tuned if you want to see another video um i have found sort of within myself a slight animosity towards dslr scanning whilst recording this video i kept saying things like yeah, which is way better than Negative Lab Pro or, or sort of words to that effect. So I think what I should do is a more detailed and uh, explanatory sort of comparison between those two softwares. So maybe the next video will be taking these exact two negatives, putting them through a DSLR scanning workflow um, as charitably as I can. I have got one of those wacky Skier Sunray copy boxes and uh, I'll, I'll put a macro lens on a DSLR and see how good a photo I can take of those. But thanks for watching and I will catch you next time.